Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see a full room that's interested in this topic. Um, I work for the World Wide Web Foundation. And actually, let me ask a quick question. How many of us know the difference between the internet and the web? That is no shame. Oh, good, OK. <laughs> good sense in the room. So last week on March 12th, the World Wide Web, which is how we most of us access the internet, turned 30 years old. Um, the inventor of the web, uh, who happens to be the founder of the Web Foundation, uh, embarked on a 30-hour tour to make, you know, commemorate this moment. But it was a bittersweet moment because in those 30 years, it was expected that this great way to connect and connect each other would get to everybody in the world. Unfortunately, um, that moment was being commemorated with the fact that only 50% of the world today, in terms of people, uh, are connected. And the rate at which <clears throat> connectivity had been growing in terms of new users has dramatically slowed down in the last 10 years. Um, obviously, this has affected uh, what is re regional, originally called the global south. Um, but there's su such uh, connections to the challenges that have been in the global south to what, has, you know, what you know as connectivity today here in France or in Europe. Um, so... Three billion people currently do not have access to the internet. And even of the three billion of us who have access, it is not equitable. We can't really speak of having the same quality of access or being able to exercise um, all the opportunities that the web presents. And so it's at that intersection that I work um, to better understand what do we mean by um, talking about digitalization against this reality and these visions that we want to have of the future of the web, even as we're talking about 5G or blockchain or every other exciting technology that's happening against this reality. Having 50% of the world on offline means that we're missing out on people who could be creating for a better web, a better um, internet, a better digital community. It means that um, because a majority of them are women, we're missing out on very unique perspectives to how society could influence, uh, so technologies could influence society. Um, so the reasons for this, uh, they're, they're interlinked. One is first and foremost a failure of uh, policies, which is by extension a failure of how governments have been working. I don't know, I've not yet been to a country where everyone is 100% happy with how government works. Um, they, you know, governments setting policies means that's how we understand how, whether it's private sector or anybody else will um, invest or make decisions. The rules of engagement have been exceptionalized in technology and by that I mean over the last 30 years of the web the tech industry as it came to be and especially from Silicon Valley was treated as this cool thing let it happen you know let the hoodie hoodie wearing dudes do their thing and it's exceptional right so do not touch it was intimidating to the people who are supposed to be holding them to account and it's only in the last five or so years we're starting to see a huge reckoning um, any any newspaper you open today it's either Cambridge Analytica or I don't know what other sort of scam and a, a large reason that happened is because there were not set, there weren't enough rules to hold them to account. So this has translated also to the fact that even in developing countries, the way we're thinking about connecting people is influenced very much by what these companies have to say. So there was a study that was done in 2016, 2017 there. Um, in, a in Asia, in um, Africa, and in Latin America. And people were asked if they use the internet. They said no. They were asked if they use Facebook. They said yes. Facebook, and I'm not goading on them, though I am, um, is the internet for a lot of people. This Facebook came to exist because a platform like the World Wide Web, which was envisioned as decentralized, as something anyone can plug into and contribute to, has started to be centralized, and in the in the experience of that, becoming the sole experience people are having. So we've moved to apps. Um, we have an app for everything nowadays, um, and that collective thing that was supposed to be decentralized, where each of us could contribute, is starting to diminish. Um, the creators of this space are also typically tend to look 
like the representation we may have in this room today, um, in that you know we are not seeing yet a way that the vision of the web being a place or the internet being a tool anybody could create for taking a mainstream uh, approach. Um, we still see that the, the technologies that will connect people are being developed in certain parts of the world. And even in the development sector, um, there's a very prescriptive way that technologies are being introduced um, to people who do not have access. So for instance, it's not abnormal to find a government saying they will partner with a private sector company from Silicon Valley to provide access to the internet, and that is being uh, accepted as, um, as the way to go. Then it's compounded by the fact that um, the way people assume, I don't know what images come to mind when you hear about Latin America or Africa or Asia, there's always that do-gooderism. I mean, surely some internet is better than none. I mean, Facebook is better than nothing. You know, let the poor people have something kind of rationale has really skewed the work that we would try to do to get people equitable access to the internet. So this is a huge uh, reflection to what is happening in society today, the inequalities that exist in society outside of technology. So in this 30 years, I think we have now learned that technology is not neutral. Uh, you don't just build and people come. Um, the 50% of people who are not connected to the internet are people that in other waves of development were always excluded. So you find that people who have no access to perhaps roads, um, electricity, water, um, infrastructure, the governments have not been in the business of seeing them. They're also very diverse in terms of language, in terms of culture, um, in terms of pr practically everything you can think of. So when you're thinking of connecting them or building or working with them to connect them to the internet, we are we're confronted for the first time with the fact that the scale that we've seen with the 50% of us who are connected will not necessarily work in that sense. Um, for instance, uh, much of the web and the internet is defined by the English language. Um, but we are now dealing with people who do not even speak that language. So when you go with a tool that is only in English, what does that say for the experience that they're going to have? There are people who've been left out of education systems, and even the informal systems of education that they have have not been recognized. They are people who um, are busy with running 30 hour days in a 24 hour day, specifically women. So when you think of let's roll out some public Wi-Fi and you put it at a community center in the middle of town, but the women are in the market, um, you're missing out on where they really are. To say that um, with the work that we have to do, and all of us have a role to play to connect the unconnected, we first have to be very humble and go to understand them and not assume that just because we've gotten this advantage um, or this connectivity that we understand what's best for them. And this is very particularly so for those who've been put in the pedestal of technology, the coders, the builders, the engineers. Uh, there's a need for such humility and understanding of the world and not thinking of people as some simulation. I have heard of companies where now when they're th trying to think of how they're going to capture the market of the unconnected, they do simulations of the experience. So it's almost use virtual reality or AR and everything else to be like, oh, let's see how that village looks and let's imagine our experience through a virtual sense. It sounds really dehumanizing actually, um, but that's how a lot of people who are building for that future are thinking of it. Um, there's, again, we already talked about, um, you know, the app, the appification of the internet. Apps are be becoming the thing that is connecting people, but people are being locked into those uh, platforms and hardly can create. So for instance, you'll find um, if I go to pr practically a huge range of countries, if you buy a SIM card to connect to the internet, uh, assuming you can afford to connect to the internet, you can only connect to like the big five. Uh, so that's what's available in terms of bundles. And I know that that's also an issue in parts of Europe as well. So how we have um, somewhat allowed that to happen, even we citizens have a role to play in terms of dismantling that. In, in that, we have to start holding um, our governments to account in terms of where they are in the equation, what the rules they're supposed to be setting for engagement, and the fact that we pay taxpayer money, and your taxpayer money, for instance, could be put to use to develop, I don't know, access to the internet for country X, because that's how development is done. But in that, we have all a role to play in that we start questioning that, how, how have we factored in the reality of these people on the ground? How are we going to enable them and work with them to learn from them what is appropriate for them? 
in specifically to access to the internet, we have seen really cool initiatives in Latin America, in, in, in Africa and elsewhere of community cooperative led um, networks. So they're called community networks. So this is where communities can do everything from building the infrastructure themselves because A, nobody was coming to connect them um, and trying to create and maintain their own network. But because governments have not stepped up, what happens is the private sector players go and block them by saying they need to apply for licenses the same way those companies do. But these companies have not been in the business of going to just serve a market if it's poor, a poor community. It's about the money, right? So there are alternatives that are starting to emerge, but again, are being blocked because um, the space that is supposed to set the rules of engagement is broken. And that's both in a, in a local, or rather local, regional, and global, and what we call the international space. So in the future, and what we're talking about, it's really a space that we, if we're going to build for another 30 years or 10 years, humility is one. Humility to go and understand who is this who has been left behind, understand that they've been at the intersection of so many inequalities, that they know what is good for them, but they're not often given um, a space, an opportunity, a platform to do that. And for the first time in the world, we have a tool or a, collect a collection of tools, which is the web and the internet, that can help us, if ideally, uh, start to solve for the many inequalities that have existed in the society today. But that is to say that we should not assume technology is this unique thing that exists out of nowhere. It's influenced by who's building it, who's shaping it, uh, who's coding for it, or um, you know, deciding for it. And we need a lot more people to be allowed to get into those spaces and set their own terms of engagement. So I know I've made technology sound like a very political project, but it is, because if, if the last 30 years have taught us anything, those utopian ideals people had about, you know, build it, they will come, put it out there, people will just connect, have been disproven. So if we can work with this moment to reckon with the fact that it's not neutral, it is gendered, it has the same political uh, you know, connotations that society offline has, we are seeing the same uh, uh, inequalities that exist offline being transported online, but it's very easy to exist in an online space and think that we have it figured out. Um, there are great things we've all unlocked from being connected, but it we should not be deluded to think that that's the necessarily the experience of others, and it's very easy to not see them at all uh, because of that kind of hyper-connectivity we're in. So that's what I work on every day. It's a very interesting headache. I came here to federate the headache because um, we need a lot more people to understand that, and in whatever sphere of work you're in and how you work with technology, just remember that at the intersection of the people who are not connected are so many inequalities, and if we're going to solve for them, we have to work with them. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And I think, I don't know if there's time for questions. I would like maybe in the order to one or two questions if there are any. No. Okay, no. <laughs> ooh, ooh, or you can, you can stay a little uh, after the session. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Very interesting. Uh, hi. First of all, I'm so happy to hear your speech. It means so many sense and uh, common values. Like, so uh, I'm not sure that I have uh, understand everything. I mean, if I do have understand half of it, it's already fine. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for my 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 question is pretty simple. How could we help? I mean, from like France, from Europe countries, which is supposed to be developed country. How could we help? Because in my mind, I would say that maybe even those developed countries have so much to learn from those undeveloped countries, right? Because uh, actually they're facing really big issues, like uh, like pretty common one, like how can we get water, uh, safe water, safe security, etc., which is really different from our windows, right? So maybe we are some developing sometimes some superficial solutions when there maybe can bring some common sense to us. So what I really would like it's how could we build some common sharing and inspiring to build like innovation by the right way mm -hmm. with good values in through uh, internet. It's a great question, one that could have a whole other session to it. But very quickly what I will say, things that we can people can learn from the developing countries is how to make 
there's so much to learn about cooperation and cooperatives and how communities um, come together in a what is called an informal economy. But there's so much of in terms of how people have innovated. So the spirit of cooperatives, like I was saying, building everything from scratch to create your own network, to connect, to own that. The skills people learn while doing that. The conversations they have while doing that is something that when you listen about how societies are broken in the West, you're like, you could use a bit of love from other people, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but again, I think it just really, it's even something simple as a mindset, um, questioning whatever next article you read about country X. And, you know, just questioning the way narratives are shaped because we already start to think that the only thing people need in developing countries is help. They also just need voice. They just need to be heard. Um, but then for them to be heard, we have to give, make room when we're used to occupying the room for them to actually bring their points of view. So it has multifaceted um, ways. And even in technology itself, there are great innovators there. But even in uh, developing countries like in Kenya, where I'm from, our tech innovation ecosystem has been captured by the same Silicon Valley mentality. So you have the same people who didn't make it in San Francisco, just get on a plane, hoo, 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 come and call their thing a Kenyan startup. So you can imagine what kinds of tensions those are going to be. But the web is already such a great space to find so many narratives people are creating about their pain points, their frustrations. Question is, are we tuned into them or do we go there the same way we're here offline? This is the same network we have online. So it's really small things, but big things as well. And watching what your governments do in terms of their relations with other countries and holding them to account.